Let's go back into the book of James. Uh, it's good to welcome those uh, on uh, YouTube and things. We have been, I will say before we start, we, we, we brought in internet into the church when the pandemic came in because we had to shut down and that way people could be able to see it and the services and stuff. Uh, our response to what we have is next to Neil and you know we're, we're seriously thinking in this you know if we don't it's just uh, thinking about what we're going to have to do in the future here because, uh, you know, the lack of response, I'll say, I'll put it that way, is, you know, for $65 a month is, you know, one thing. But we'll see. I, I just want. I just hope that people, that if you're watching out there, that you'll, you know, we have services. They're on here every time. Very seldom do we not have something on here. So uh, I hope that you will uh, tune in to watch it. Uh, in James chapter one, we are uh, in verses beginning verse 12 uh, to verse number 16. It says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Verse 16 says, Do not err, my beloved brethren, so in this, we, we, we find that James is talking about the struggle with temptation. You know, the, the American Express card used to run a commercial on television with its slogan, you know, don't leave home without it. Unfortunately, this is what happens in the life of, Christian, of a Christian when it uh, concerns the issue of temptation. The believer faces temptation at home and when he leaves home. Our tussle, our struggle with temptation is a never-ending battle and it just won't go away. Uh, it's like an annoying fly or a mosquito that keeps buzzing in your ear. Uh, he just constantly there. Uh, James addresses the issue of temptation in this portion of Scripture and he gives important principles dealing with temptation. And our ability to deal with temptation will determine how mature we will be in our Christian life. Uh, so we find there in verse 12 we find the blessing of in enduring temptation. You know, can the question comes, can, can blessing come from temptation? And James says that it can. Yes. He said the word blessed uh, literally means happy or blessed. It carries the idea of a great inner joy and satisfaction. It's the same word that's used in the Beatitudes as found in Matthew chapter 5 and could be considered an addition 
to the list of the Beatitudes. As we continue to go through the book of James, we will see the influence of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 on this particular book, the book of James. So how is a man blessed? Well, basically it tells us here in verse 12, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. So if we want to know how a man is blessed by temptation, because he endures it. So what, what literally, what does it mean to endure temptation? Well, if we look at the word endureth, it literally means to patiently, courageously endure, to wait and to remain through a trial or a test, to stand your ground, or basically as Paul puts it, to persevere. We are to, uh, to do these things. And we do it with patience. You know, this person overcomes the temptation through the power of Christ in his life. Uh, he will not quit no matter how hard or how heavy the load is to bear. And believe me, the load can be awful heavy at times. He has the same type of attitude that we would find like in a person like Jonas Salk. Salk, S-A-L-K. Uh, Jonas was uh, with one that, uh, that attempted, he attempted 200 unsuccessful vaccines for polio before he came up with the one that worked. He just kept at it. Somebody asked him one time, how did it feel to fail 200 times trying to invent a vaccine for polio? This was his response. I never failed 200 times at anything in my life. My family taught me never to use that word. I simply discovered 200 ways how not to make a vaccine for polio. Our victory is in Jesus. None of it. Romans 8, 35-39 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, nakedness, peril or sword? 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. 37, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. 38, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Verse 39, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, there, there's, there's nothing that could separate a born again believer from God. As long as, as we got Jesus, there's nothing that can separate us. Jesus made that statement in, Matt, uh, or in John chapter 14. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but through me. So uh, it, it's all Jesus. We, we got to look, you know, what does James mean by the, by the word temptation? The word comes, it, it, it is the same word that is used in, in James chapter 1 verse 2 and it's translated as temptation or trial. All trials have an element of temptation and all temptations have an element of trial. When we endure, when we remain faithful to the Lord in spite 
of the test, the trial, the temptation, we are greatly blessed. When we remain faithful, no matter what may come our way, we're blessed. Because we have that, we can have at that point, that moment, that inner joy, that inner peace that only Jesus can, can provide for us. Our tests can be, are to be endured. Our temptations are to be resisted. We look and, and there, there's something, you know, that we have to, to uh, understand that uh, James says, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love Him. So, you know, these uh, who faithfully endure their tests and their trials will be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. There's judgment coming for everybody. Saved and unsaved. It's not a reference to God's gift of eternal life. It obviously refers to something else. All Christians have an appointment with the Lord. And we're all going to keep it one of these days. And we must give an accounting of our lives to the Savior. And Apostle Paul makes it very clear in Romans 14 and verses 10 through 12. He says, But my doest thou, but why doest thou judge thy brother? Or why doest thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 11 says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. And every tongue shall confess to God. Verse 12, So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So we have to realize in this what uh, James is attempting. He's, he, he's trying to tell the folks here, just as he is telling you and I here, that there are rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. You know, Paul makes it clear that we are not to be judging others because we're all going to be judged by the Lord someday. God gives all judgment under the sun. Jesus is the judge. And God gives Him that authority. We all have an appointment with the Lord and we will all give an accounting of our lives. We are going to be audited by the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. And, and if you ask me, that it, it, it's a very sobering thought and should be pondered quite a bit in our own lives. It, it, it's just like the Lord's Supper. You know, there is a, an examination that must take place as each individual examines their own life before they partake. We will give an accounting for what we have done or not done. For the believer, the uh, judgment seat of Christ it is not a judgment of our sins because our sins are gone by what Jesus did. But at the judgment seat of Christ, we will stand before Him in what we either did or did not do in His name. So it's not sin that we're being judged for, but it is our Christian walk with Him. There are two key times of judgment that are coming in the future. One of them, 
as we've said, is a judgment for Christians only. And it's known as the judgment seat of Christ. The other is the judgment for all unsaved folks known as the great white throne judgment where they will be shown why they're going to hell. There's some things we have to realize about these two judgments. For one, at the judgment seat of Christ, only Christians are going to be there. No one is going to hell. But at the great white throne judgment, no one goes to hell. They all go to hell. At the judgment seat of Christ, as we just stated, no unsaved people are there. Just believers born-again believers are at the judgment seat of Christ. At the great white throne judgment, saved people are present as witnesses against the unsaved. According to Matthew 12, in verse 41, it says, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment from this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Thirdly, at the judgment seat of Christ, this judgment concerns the service of believers that will be used to determine their rewards. At the great white throne judgment, Sin is judged. And the degree of punishment in hell is determined. Four. At the judgment seat of Christ, it will take place after the rapture. Matthew 16, verse 27 says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. The great white throne, this will take place at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. Revelation 20, verse 7 through 11. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Verse 9, And then, and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Verse 11, And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. You know, when, when we come, we have to, uh, to realize that, there, that these are, are just some of the passages that give us insights about the judgment of Christians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, Paul wrote, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. So if we break this down, it says, for we must all appear. There's an appointment that we all are going to keep. There's no getting out of this judgment 
and there will be no delaying it. We will be face to face with Jesus, our judge. There will be no concealment, no hiding, no pretending or excuses. No spin or attorneys will be present. The look in his eyes will say it all. And this word appear literally means made manifest, turned inside out. We will be under the scrutiny of the Lord Jesus. Basically, He will be magnified, glass looking at our walk with Him. He will see us as we really are and deal with issues that need to be dealt with. He continues in that verse. He says, For we must all appear where? Before the judgment seat of Christ. This seat is the word bema. Every three years the Corinthians had contests in the stadium outside of Corinth known as the Istamayan Games. They lasted four weeks. The contestants were professional athletes. And upon entry, they had to certify that they had been in training 12 months and had followed rigid rules and guidelines. The contestants were under the supervision of many judges. And if a person appeared to be the victor in an event, he was not declared victorious until the judges met and agreed that no rules had been broken. If they appeared, if they agreed, the judge led the athlete to the middle of the city square court. In the center of the square was a stone platform that was 40 feet long, 20 feet high, and about, or 20 feet wide and about 8 feet above the ground. This stone was called the Bema. Athletes were awarded with laurel wreaths called the Victor's Crown. And the Bema did not conjure up ideas of guilt and punishment, but instead on victory, reward, and honor. You know, that's when we look, that's what uh, the judgment seat of Christ is to believers. It, it's a place where we are either receiving rewards or rewards will be taken from us. But either way, it's judging Christians. And then we look and it says, that verse continues, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that, to what he had done, whether it be good or or bad. The terms good or bad do not mean righteous or sinful. It means acceptable or worthless. Unacceptable. Chapter 5 in uh, verse 9 literally said, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of Him. Our goal is that our service for Christ is acceptable to Him. It doesn't make any difference whether our service is acceptable to us, whether it's acceptable to the world, whether it's accept, uh, acceptable to the church. All that matters is whether or not at the judgment seat of Christ, whether it is acceptable to Jesus. He is the ultimate reward. Every one of us has the opportunity for the well done of Jesus Christ. To hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. That's what we're going for. And every Christian has that ability. Christ will examine our motive of service and our faithfulness. 
that which is done with the wrong motives, like glorifying self instead of Christ, unfaithfulness, neglect of duty or opportunities, will be considered unacceptable, worthless, labor, and unrewardable. The loss of reward, the loss of His well done, the loss of crowns and opportunities to rule in His kingdom will be a painful reprimand to us that will last for all eternity. The sting from our lack of an answer will be very painful if the Lord should ask, why did you not do this or do that? in my name. Little rewards or a lack of any rewards will be a shameful rebuke of how we lived our life. Having nothing to show for how we lived our lives will reveal our character and the quality of our faithfulness. Could we feel shame and sadness at the judgment seat of Christ? Yes. We can. Many will feel shame because they've just wasted their lives on self instead of on the Lord. 1 John 2 and verse 28 says, And now, little children, abide in Him that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. Revelation 21, verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are all passed away. The rewards, or lack of them, will tell all about our lives. It will tell all about our service. All about our faithfulness or unfaithfulness. They will honor us or rebuke us. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. If there be any false accusations brought against us, they will be brought to light. Any wrongs and injustices against us will be made right. Misunderstandings will all be cleared up. And if we need vindication, the Lord will take care of that. Romans 12 and 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place under wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Earl Rodmacher said this. He said, The person I am becoming today is preparing me for the person I shall be for all eternity. The person you are today will determine the rewards and the responsibilities of tomorrow. Your life now will impact your responsibilities in eternity. You know, there, there are a number of Christians that, that may say, well, you know, I really don't care about eternal rewards in heaven. Well, I, believe, I, don't, I don't believe that's true. I don't believe it can be true if they're truly born again. Because those same people are killing themselves trying to accumulate great rewards now
they profess that they will be content with just a shack in heaven but want a big home here on earth. And if reward, recognition, or position is important now, it will be important in eternity as well. But it may be just too late. Our chance to serve the King of Kings is right now. Right now. We, we can't wait till we set foot in heaven and say, oh, I'll serve Him. we got to serve Him right now. That's the thing. It's right now. Because right now determines eternity. Because we have a fear of reference for God and we want our lives to be pleasing to Him. We try to win others to Christ. This is the meaning of the word terror that's found in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 11 which says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. We persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. Uh, there's another key verse that deals with the judgment seat of Christ and it's found in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians in verses 11 through 15 and that is where we'll pick up I don't want to go any further because I won't be able to finish so you know we look and we realize that James is trying to tell the folks. I mean, when we have looked at what Peter had tried to tell the folks, we looked at what John had tried to tell the folks, we've seen and we're seeing in and through the verses and even in some of the books that we've looked at already, how Paul is trying to, to get the people to see and to understand well, you know, if it's good enough for all those folks to be able to see and to understand, then it's certainly good enough for you and I to be able to see and understand what is trying to be said here. Not only by from what Paul says here in First and Second Corinthians, but what James is saying here in James, in the book of James. You know, it, it is for us to endure these temptations and stay true to the course. That's what he, he, he's trying to get us to realize. Because we will answer one way or another before Christ. So let's uh, we'll, we'll pray, you know. They say we're supposed to get some rain. Pray we do. Lord knows what we need. Uh, we continue to just uh, lift up each and, and everyone. Certainly that's uh, on our prayer list for sure and those that we may even fail to mention at times. So let's pray and we can be dismissed this evening. Lord, we do lift up Your holy name this evening. Lord, we pray and, and Lord, we just... Uh, ask, Lord, that You would continue to lead and to guide us, Lord, as only You can, realizing that there will come one day when You will be judged over us. Lord, we, we lift up our prayer list to You and, and each and every petition that was made on it. Lord, we lift up those firemen that are still in the hospital this evening, Lord, from the fire today. Lord, we just lift them up to You and ask that You would uh, just be able to reach down and to touch their, uh, their bodies, Lord, and heal them as a great physician that You are. Lord, we uh, continue to lift up each and every petition, Lord, and ask that You'd have Your will and way. 
Lord, continue to be with us. Lord, we ask that you would uh, uh, take us not only from this place this evening, Lord, and let us reach home uh, in a in a safe manner, but Lord, that you would lift us up as we uh, come back into your house this this coming Sunday, Lord. Uh, prepare our hearts long before we ever get here to receive you, Lord, and to honor and to praise your holy name. Lord, we love you and we thank you for it's in the, the precious name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen.